While millions of people are literally crying over 22 strangers kicking a ball, screaming at TVs like their lives depend on it, painting their faces in war colors, you're sitting there wondering if you're broken. Spoiler alert, you're not broken. You're not boring. You're not missing the fun gene. You're just wired like a psychological unicorn. And neuroscience can prove it. By the end of this episode, you'll understand why your brain is fundamentally different from sports fanatics and why that might actually make you more evolved. Let's dive in. Here's the thing. Sports fans aren't crazy. They're just stuck in a 10,000-year-old software update. See, back in prehistoric times, your survival depended on one thing, your tribe. If your tribe lost a battle, you died. If your tribe won, you ate. Simple. Fast forward to 2026, and that tribal wiring is still hard-coded into most brains. Except now, instead of survival, it's the Dallas Cowboys. Their brains literally cannot tell a difference between their ancient tribe and a sports team. When their team wins, oxytocin floods their system, the same bonding hormone from childbirth. When their team loses, cortisol spikes like they've been physically attacked. Neuroscientists at UCLA found that watching your team lose triggers the same brain regions as social rejection or physical pain. Their limbic system is literally treating a game like a life or death situation, while your brain correctly identifies it as entertainment. But here's where you're different. Your brain didn't fall for the glitch. You see 11 strangers in matching shirts, and your amygdala goes, yeah, that's not my tribe. Your prefrontal cortex stays online. You're immune to the illusion. Wild, right? Let's talk about why sports fans are literally addicted and why you're not. Sports operate on intermittent reinforcement, the same psychological trick that makes slot machines so addictive. You don't know if your team will win or lose, so every game is a dopamine lottery. When their team scores, boom. Dopamine surge, euphoria. They feel like they just won. When their team loses... Dopamine crash, depression, genuine grief. Their brains are on an emotional roller coaster and they keep buying tickets. Here's the insane part. Research shows diehard sports fans experience dopamine fluctuations up to 20% higher than baseline during games, the same narrow chemical volatility seen in gambling addicts. They're literally getting biochemically hijacked every weekend. But your brain? It asks, why would I outsource my happiness to 11 strangers who don't know I exist? You're less susceptible to parasocial relationships, those one-sided emotional bonds. You crave real connection, mutual relationships, actual conversations. Sports fans are getting high on imaginary friendships. You're not wired for that drug. Here's the psychological kicker. Sports fans use external tribes to complete their identity puzzle. Think about it. They say we won when their team wins, but they lost when their team loses. That pronoun switch? That's their ego protecting itself by merging with the group. Their sense of self is incomplete without the tribe. The team logo becomes part of their identity. The jersey is armor. The stadium is church. Psychologist Henry Tajfel's social identity theory explains this perfectly. People with weaker individual identities cling harder to group identities to feel significant. The louder someone screams about their team, the quieter their sense of self actually is. But you? Your identity puzzle is already complete. You don't need a team to tell you who you are. You've built your sense of self from internal values, personal achievements, and individual interests. Psychologists call this intrinsic identity formation versus extrinsic identity formation. You're intrinsic, they're extrinsic. You're a whole person, they're a puzzle missing pieces, desperately searching for the team logo to fill the gaps. Let's continue with section four, the empathy allocation theory. Now here's where it gets fascinating. You do have empathy. You do have passion. You're just spending it differently. Neuroscientist Dr. Paul Zak found that humans have a limited empathy budget. We can only care deeply about so many things before we hit emotional bankruptcy. Sports fans, they're dumping 60% of their empathy budget into millionaire athletes they'll never meet. That's empathy they are not spending on their actual friends, their family, or their own personal growth. Think about it. The average NFL fan spends 11 hours per week watching games, checking scores, and arguing online about players. That is 572 hours per year, the equivalent of 71 full workdays invested in people who wouldn't recognize them on the street. 
You, you've allocated your empathy to things that matter. Real people, real causes, real relationships. When a sports fan's team loses, they are devastated for days. When your friend needs help, you're there. That's not coldness. That's strategic emotional intelligence. Research from Stanford's Center for Compassion shows that people who direct empathy toward reciprocal relationships, relationships that give back, experience 40% less burnout and significantly higher life satisfaction. You're not missing out on connection. You're just refusing to waste it on a one-way street. You're not emotionally stunted. You're emotionally optimized. Next. Section 5, The Flow State Difference. Sports fans claim they watch for the thrill, but what they're really chasing is something called a flow state. Flow is that magical mental state where you're fully immersed, time disappears, and you feel truly alive. Sports fans get micro doses of flow by watching others perform. But you, you're not satisfied with watching flow. You want to experience it. You'd rather play an instrument. Build something, create art, solve problems, learn skills, activities where you are the athlete, not a passive spectator. And here's the brutal truth. Vicarious flow, the kind you get from watching, activates only 30% of the neural networks that a direct flow experience does. They're getting the psychological equivalent of decaf coffee while you're mainlining the real thing. Studies from Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, the godfather of flow research, show that people who generate their own flow states report 40% higher life satisfaction than those who just consume others' flow. You're not missing out. You're leveling up. Section 6. The Genetic Wild Card Plot twist. Some of this might be genetic. Research on the DRD4 gene, the novelty-seeking gene, shows that people with certain variants are less likely to engage in tribalistic behavior and more likely to seek individual experiences. Scientists call this the explorer gene. It's the same genetic marker found in higher concentrations among entrepreneurs, artists, and people who've migrated across continents. You're literally carrying the DNA of pioneers, not followers. There's also evidence that people with higher baseline serotonin levels don't need the external dopamine hits that sports provide. They're already content. So yeah, you might literally be genetically wired to not care about sports. You're not broken. You're a different phenotype. And finally, Section 7, the social pressure trap. Let's address the elephant in the room, the social cost. Sports fans will call you boring. They'll say you're no fun. They'll exclude you from conversations. They'll make you feel like an alien. But here's the truth. Their need for you to care about sports is their insecurity, not your deficiency. They need everyone in the tribe because it validates their own obsession. If you don't care, it threatens their worldview. It's cognitive dissonance. You're holding up a mirror, and they don't like what they see. Stay strong, unicorn. So, here's the bottom line. You're not broken. You're not boring. You're not missing out. You're just a human who refuses to outsource your identity, your dopamine, and your empathy to a corporate entertainment product designed to exploit tribal psychology. You're someone who values real connection over parasocial fantasy. Someone who creates flow instead of consuming it. Someone whose identity is self-authored, not team-branded. And honestly, that's not just different. That's evolved. So next time someone asks, how can you not care about sports? Just smile and say, I care about things that care back. Now go live your life, you beautiful psychological unicorn.